Good evening. I'm Eileen Makovich, the director of the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library and Museum. Welcome. <laughs> but we don't want nobody, nobody sent. Thus began the distinguished political career of Judge Abner J. Mikva. Following his military service in World War II, Judge Mikva enrolled as a law student at the University of Chicago. At that time, Paul Douglas was a United States Senator, and Adlai Stevenson, too, was Governor of Illinois. Judge Mikva wanted to volunteer. He had to persist and persist and persist, because, as you know, we don't want nobody, nobody sent. That was the comment of the alderman surrogate uh, in uh, Hyde Park. Judge Mikva served in the House of Representatives in the General Assembly in Illinois, then in the United States Congress representing Hyde Park, and then Evanston. Then President Carner appointed him to the United States Court of Appeals on the D.C. Circuit. He rose to chief judge. He served for 16 years. From 1994 to 95, he served as White House counsel to President Clinton. Thus, he has held high positions in all three branches of the federal government and, of course, Illinois government as well. President Obama, in November of this year, presented him with the Presidential Medal of Freedom, our nation's highest civilian honor. We are most honored here at the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library and Museum because Judge Mikva has presented his papers to our library. There is much to learn from his career, which is, as many of you know here, ongoing. Upon his retirement, he taught at the law school at the University of Chicago. But he is always remembered that we don't want nobody, nobody sent, and that was his job to remedy that situation. He and his wife, Zoe, have founded a not-for-profit organization known as the Mikva Challenge. Its mission is to engage high school students in elections, in community affairs, in understanding the complex government processes at all levels. We are hopeful, at least I am very hopeful, that Judge Mikva will find a way to start a Mikva challenge here in Springfield and in other parts of Illinois. It would be good for us to be able to continue working with high school students and have the challenge of the Mikva challenge buoying us on. I want to thank C-SPAN this evening for its coverage of our program. Let me tell you very briefly about the format. Um, Judge Mikva will speak. He will speak about an interesting subject, the two Illinois presidents. After he speaks, Mark Depew, the head of our oral history department at the museum and library, uh, will entertain and discuss a few questions because you know Mark has interviewed the judge. Thereafter, it's up to you and we have microphones here for you to not put him on the hot seat, although he's very comfortable being on the hot seat. The, the judge will speak to you and answer your questions. So an exciting evening. It's my honor and my pleasure to ask Judge Mikva to speak to us here in the library. Thank you very much, Eileen Makovich, for that generous introduction. Let me first say how uh, pleased I am that Speaker Mike Madigan has taken time out of his busy schedule to attend tonight's schedule. Michael is an old and dear friend, and I am honored that he is here. Um, every time I hear my introduction these days, I begin to think that maybe they're reading my eulogy or my obituary. <laughs> the late Congressman Sid Yates used to tell a story about uh, after he'd made a speech one night, this constituent came up to him and gushed, Congressman, you're such a good Congressman, they ought to name a building after you. And he said, well, Madam, they usually do that posthumously. And she said, well, I hope it's soon. <laughs> I want to talk about 
the two presidents from Illinois. Now, the historians here should uh, immediately say, well, how do you say two presidents from Illinois? Ronald Reagan was born in Illinois, and that's true. But Ronald Reagan was elected from, from California. And indeed, if we have another president who was born in Illinois, as I hope and expect will happen next year, uh, I'm not sure she will count as an Illinois president because she will be elected, I presume, from New York. But Abraham Lincoln and Barack Obama were elected from Illinois. Uh, neither one was born here, as you know. There are an incredible number of similarities that you can talk about. Physically, they uh, almost look alike, except for difference in color. Uh, both of them are tall and lean. Both have big ears. Um, uh, they both were incredibly good wordsmiths. I don't use the word orator because there's no question that Barack Obama is a brilliant orator. Uh, obviously, I never heard Abraham Lincoln speak, but his speaking voice apparently had none of the mellifluousness of Barack Obama's, uh, but he did know how to put words together. Uh, for example, when the uh, Lincoln-Douglas debates are described, at least by the, the, uh, cover, the media of the Times, uh, in most coverage, uh, Douglas was presumed to was, uh, uh, appear to have won the debates. Um, again, I wasn't there, so I can't tell you, but I do know that uh, Lincoln's words have lived on in history. But there's more than just the physical and the oratorical likenesses. Both had incredibly similar political careers. Abraham Lincoln served many terms in the state legislature here in Illinois. He served one term in Congress, and then he became president. Barack Obama served many terms in the Illinois legislature, part of a term in the United States Senate, and then he became president. Their records, their performances in the state legislature are particularly similar. Uh, as was true then, and I think is still true now, maybe not so true under the strong leadership of uh, Mike Madigan and John Cullerton, but in my days, uh, we had little groups that formed together that uh, uh, voted alike and thought alike and uh, tried to make ourselves a small power group. Uh, mine consisted, my group in, in the 50s and 60s consisted of Paul Simon, and Tony Scariano, and uh, Bob Mann, and I. And um, Tony Scariano dubbed us the Kosher Nostra. <laughs> now, obviously, he was the Nostra part of it. And Bob Mann and I were Jewish, and uh, therefore we were the Kosher part. But I pointed out to Tony that Paul Simon was not Jewish. He was a Lutheran. And Tony thought about it, and he said, well, that's all right, he votes Jewish. <laughs> when Lincoln was in the legislature, he headed up a group called the Long Knives. And they were a very influential group of state legislators. Um, not always working in the public interest. One of the great stories that was told about Lincoln, as you recall, the capital, the capital of uh, Illinois used to be the old Sangamon County Courthouse. And when the tour directors would take people on, on tour past the courthouse, they would point to the second story window that Abraham Lincoln supposedly jumped out of to keep a quorum from being present in his committee. Well, those of us who know the history assume that this was on some great human rights issue uh, involving, uh, involved in Illinois, some great public issue. To the extent that the story is true, the issue was not that, uh, that spectacular. It was an issue involving some pork barrel for the Illinois Central Railroad. And Lincoln and his long knives were pressing the Illinois Central's case. 
partly perhaps because uh, Lincoln represented the Illinois Central Railroad at that time. Uh, well, the, supposedly the good guys came running in at that point, and when Lincoln and his long knives saw that they were about to be overvoted, they jumped out the window and ran down the stairs to keep a quorum from being present. I used to tell my constituents on the South Side that you can draw one of three questions, uh, one of three uh, uh, points from that uh, story, and one is that uh, nothing has changed about the Illinois legislature. <laughs> the other is that you now understand why the Illinois Central Railroad uh, behaved so badly as it did up to the time it was taken over by Amtrak. Or the third is that when somebody becomes president, they rise to the heights necessary to perform in the job. I'd like to think that to the extent that story is true, uh, it's the third of those. Barack Obama had an interesting and a very successful career in the state legislature. He passed a bill that uh, provided recording of interviews of prisoners by, by police. And uh, what was fascinating is not only that he passed it, but the basis on which he passed it. He persuaded law enforcement uh, that they would be better off with a a television, uh, a televised record of what was done during the interrogation so they wouldn't have to face these charges afterwards if they had abused the prisoner in some way. And so when the bill finally passed the Senate, it passed with the enthusiastic support of sheriffs and chiefs of police all over the state of Illinois. Um, Barack Obama also passed a bill, I remember this one quite well, uh, that uh, proposed public financing for the uh, election of judges. Um, I continue to worry about this crisis that exists in Illinois courts. I'm not entirely happy with the idea of electing our judges anyway, but I particularly am concerned with the election of Supreme Court judges where the stakes have become very, very high between business and the, the uh, uh, defense bar and business and labor. And as a result, a huge amount of money is being spent by candidates to be elected to the state Supreme Court. And I remember that uh, Obama was able to pass a bill through the Senate that provided for public financing of uh, state judges in Illinois. And I also remember a meeting that Paul Simon and I had with Speaker Madigan trying to persuade him to uh, support the bill. And Mike uh, is always worried not about just today but tomorrow as well. And he worried that that bill would soon be expanded to provide for public financing of state legislators and other state officials. And uh, he gave us a very polite hearing but uh, we never got beyond the hmm stage, and uh, the bill was never called. Lincoln was opposed to the war in Mexico, and uh, in one of his speeches in Congress, he made a very, I thought, a very stirring uh, speech against our position in the war in Mexico, that we had no exit strategy and that uh, we shouldn't be there. I remember quoting from it in, my 1970, in the 1970s when I was in Congress, when I was opposing the war in Vietnam. And unfortunately, neither President Lincoln nor I were very successful in persuading our colleagues at the time to end the war soon. As you remember, Barack Obama made a good part of his political history <coughs> with a speech against the war in Iraq, so that he was perhaps uh, uh, the only contender in 2008, and indeed before then, uh, who could uh, specifically say that he had opposed the war in Iraq and that we shouldn't have been there in the first place. It's going to be interesting to watch uh, Hillary Clinton in this upcoming campaign try to defend her vote for the war uh, when she was there as against what ultimately became her position and most Democrats' position that uh, we should not have been in Iraq and that indeed the results of that war are 
are worse for Iraq and for the world than are not having gone in at all. Lincoln was a great compromiser when he was in the state legislature. He thought that it was um, the best way to legislate was to govern by bipartisan and bicamerally. Uh, he had a great deal of influence in the state senate, even though he was not a member. He had a great deal of influence with the Democrats, even though he was a Whig. as did Barack Obama. As you recall, when Barack Obama announced for president, uh, one of the Republican leaders publicly came out and supported him, uh, despite his party label, and uh, took some heat for doing it, too. As a result of uh, their experiences in the state legislature, both Obama and Lincoln came into the presidency with great hopes that they could govern the same way they had acted in the, in the legislature on a bipartisan uh, basis. Uh, you may recall that Lincoln was very, very, I shouldn't say he was ambivalent about slavery. No one knows how he, what his original feelings were, but he clearly was not ready to, to take any uh, drastic action to end slavery in the United States. He made a speech saying that if he could save the nation half slave and half free, he would do so. If he could save the nation uh, no slave, he would do so. But the important thing was to save the nation. And uh, one of the interesting things about the Emancipation Proclamation, one of the curious things about it, is that it was not any kind of... Uh, 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 national emancipation of colored people. Indeed, it didn't even apply to all the southern states. It only applied to those states that had seceded where the Union Army has, uh, where the Union Army had not prevailed. So that, that in effect, uh, the original uh, effects of the Emancipation Proclamation was to free a very few number of the slaves. Barack Obama came into the presidency thinking that he too could work with Republicans. He uh, talked about a new uh, idea that the parties could get together and, and uh, work out problems on a bipartisan basis. And you'll recall that uh, just as Lincoln faced the proposition that before he even took office, South Carolina had seceded and other states followed. Obama faced the proposition that even before he was sworn in, Senator Mitch O'Connell, the Republican Senate leader, said the biggest task we have in the Senate is to keep Obama from getting a second term. Well, that hardly speaks well for the ability of the presidents to make progress. And yet both of them did. Uh, obviously, the war was thrust upon uh, Abraham Lincoln, and the, the outcome of that war was determined by many other things than his military skills. Uh, obviously, the, the uh, economic downturn, that the, the economic disaster that Obama faced when he came in was thrust upon him. And uh, it was more than his great economic theories that pulled us out of it. But the interesting thing was that when Obama, excuse me, when Lincoln realized that uh, he would not have a whole country to govern and that he would have to fight uh, uh, more than a third of the country just to keep them in the Union, it did not keep him from doing some of the other great things that uh, were accomplished during his presidency. We built the Intercontinental Railroad during that presidency. We established the land-grant colleges during that presidency. And these were done despite the fact that there was so much attention that had to be paid about the war. President Obama's history uh, is similar. Despite the fact that we were in the worst economic de uh, decline since the Great Depression, uh, he was pushing through on health care while he had the majority. Uh, pushed uh, through a change in policy about gays in the military, uh, pushed through substantial environmental changes in, in our laws governing the climate, governing 
the use of our resources. And even after he, lo <coughs> after he lost his majority in 2010, uh, there are many things that happened under Obama's administration. Uh, the substantial, uh, almost uh, uh, race of gender equality to get rid of don't ask, don't tell, to uh, recognize gay marriages, to uh, treat uh, transgenders and gays and lesbians with, with uh, the respect and uh, support of the laws as far as discrimination was concerned. Lincoln, during the, the height of the war and even up to the time of his assassination, was planning a reconstruction policy that would somehow allow the South to, to get out from under the, their own burden of a slave economy of trying to make it uh, as an economic uh, set of states without the institution of slavery. Uh, Lincoln's uh, efforts to put through that reconstruction, and I should say that both uh, Lincoln and Obama were facing not only the opposition in Congress of the opposition parties, but sometimes of their own party as well. And indeed, Lincoln's greatest opposition to his reconstruction policy were the, the, way, the uh, Republicans of the time who were the hardcore Republicans who wanted to punish the South for their, their bringing on the Civil War. Uh, as you know, even after President Obama passed Obamacare in the first two years of his presidency, uh, ever since that time, including the present, uh, much of the Republican Opposition is based on uh, the policy of trying to repeal Obamacare. And until uh, last month's uh, success in the Supreme Court on this key provision, upholding it as, as meaning what the, what the government said it meant, uh, there was great doubt about whether Obamacare would have a chance to succeed or not. And in all this, neither president has been able to do what they started out to try to do, and that is to bring people together to reconcile the great differences that divide us north and south and uh, on a religious basis and on many other bases on which we divide ourselves. Neither of them were able to use what they considered their greatest skill in governing. And that perhaps is their greatest similarity. Both of them earnestly and ferociously believed in government. Theirs was not a government of, of uh, di divisions and a government of decline. Theirs was an idea that government should expand and do more things, build railroads, build colleges, build an infrastructure, uh, take care of people's health. They were presidents who believed and continue to believe uh, that government is some is a positive good and not a necessary evil. And perhaps I can close with reminding you of the great debate there is about how to declaim the the Gettysburg Address. There are those who insist that it should be and that a government of the people, by the people, and for the people shall not perish from the earth and those who say it shall be a government of the people, by the people, and for the people shall not perish from the earth. I've always thought that the great message of the Gettysburg Address was the way that closing piece begins, that the government of the people, by the people, and shall, for the people shall not perish from the earth. Illinois has sent two great people to the presidency, and we are the greater for their having been there. Thank you very much. Yeah, that's fine. I'll go where the steps are. Mark, do you want to? Yeah, Mark. Here, John. This is two steps. Thank you.
I'll put you over in here. Okay. It's just there's a nasty step there. I don't want you to miss. No, I won't. I won't do it. Much as I like this audience, I don't want to fall for them. <laughs> <laughs> well, Judge, you're obviously quick on your feet. <laughs> That's why I use this, we this weapon. <laughs> Thank you again for coming here, and I think we probably ought to start. I get to have the privilege, since you and I have had long conversations before. I Spoiled, I get to ask the first few questions, but uh, we're going to give the audience plenty of time to ask questions as well. But I thought it might be appropriate that uh, you tell us a little bit more about what the mikvah challenge is. Oh, I'm delighted. When uh, my wife and I left Washington in 1995 or 96, uh, my former staff, her former staff, I uh, got together at a dinner and they told us they wanted to do something to, in our honor. And we talked about the internship and a lecture series. And my wife, who is very direct, said, you know, there are a thousand internships and lectureships. Why don't we do something that gets kids involved in politics? And just like we got involved, and it's true, most of us, uh, most people who get involved in politics get involved at the high school level, either because there's a teacher that promotes them or parents that uh, uh, encourage them to. In the inner city of Chicago, there are no such natural uh, encouragements. And as a result, most kids that graduated from Chicago high schools have never been involved in politics. And all they know is, uh, and they don't even know this anymore, but we used to teach this terrible civics course, which taught you when the War of 1812 was and who was buried in Grant's tomb and other important information like that, and that was it. So uh, thanks to my wife's encouragement, we started talking about a program that would encourage and uh, support teachers that would bring high school students in Chicago into the political arena. And one of our first difficulties was to make sure that this was being done on a bipartisan level. And so I got people like Bob Michael, who was the former minority leader of the uh, House of Representatives in Washington, and uh, um, Ed Derwinski, who was a uh, Republican congressman from the suburbs, and uh, uh, there was another important one, it'll come to me in a moment, uh, to be co-sponsors, <coughs> and I assured them that we would do it on a bipartisan basis. And then we had to get it through the IRS in order to get a 501c3 status that would allow contributions to be deductible as charitable contributions. And we have had to go through great uh, difficulties from time to time to get students to volunteer for candidates of the opposition as well as candidates that they favor. Uh, perhaps our hardest difficulty was when Barack Obama was running against Alan Keyes. It was very difficult. We had to twist an awful lot of arms to get some of the kids to volunteer, volunteer for the Keys uh, campaign, but we did. Uh, <coughs> as a result, we have now some, and, and then uh, fortunately we took advantage of a great law that the Illinois legislature passed, which allows high school seniors to act as election day judges. Uh, this was the best win-win situation that ever happened. First of all, these high school seniors know a lot more about uh, computers and the election process than the, do the retired political widows that have previously been our judges. And so the election process has improved dramatically since that law was passed. And in addition, we get several thousand students to spend an election day, a very long and uh, uh, tiring election day, seeing the election process firsthand, in addition to which they get paid. <coughs> um, 
I, it used to be $150. I don't know what it is now, but it's still a goodly amount for a high school student. <clears throat> as I say, it has improved the election process in, in uh, the state as well as providing this opportunity for students to get involved. But more than that, we get them involved in, in all kinds of civic activities. We, we um, uh, form, uh, with the help of uh, first Mayor Richie Daly and now Mayor uh, Rahm Emanuel, a mayor's council of high school advisors that meet with him on a regular basis to talk about city issues. We have uh, 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 groups that meet with the local school system, uh, local school administrators to talk about safety issues and and school lunchroom issues and everything else under the sun. I remember when I first uh, proposed this idea to the then CEO of the uh, Chicago school system, uh, Richie Daly was running for re-election and uh, the uh, CEO, as he agreed to cooperate with this, uh, put his arm on my shoulder and he said, now Ab, it won't do us any good if this gets known as the re-elect Richard Daly committee and I agreed and we've been very careful to make sure that there's as much equality of the support for candidates when they're running in campaigns. But we do get them involved in all the campaigns, in state representative, in congressional, in, in uh, uh, senatorial and in the presidential. Every uh, four years we send groups to, to Iowa and to New Hampshire to uh, witness the the uh, election processes in those first two states, which are so important to the way we nominate our candidates. Um, the process basically is getting interested teachers. We pay them a nominal uh, a stipend uh, of a couple thousand dollars to get them to devote their time and to select the students that they think will be interested in this, this uh, uh, make for challenge set of activities. And over the years we, oh, and then I forgot one thing that we do with Justice Ann Burke, which is the soapbox derby. One of the important, obviously one of the most important things you need to be active and successful in public life is the capacity to speak publicly. And as you know, the high schools don't have things like speech courses and oratory courses as they did when I was in high school and as many of you were. So with Justice Burke, we run the Soapbox Derby every year where these students actually compete in oratorical contests uh, uh, with each other and uh, their prizes awarded to those who deliver the best speeches. And I am delighted whenever we, I hear some of them speak to hear how articulate they can be with a little bit of coaching from the outside. I think one of the great highlights of my uh, enthusiasm about the Mikva Challenge so far is that when I was at the White House getting the Medal of Freedom, this young woman came up to me and she said, Judge, you don't remember me, but I was in the Mikva Challenge and I graduated from high school and I went to college and to law school and now I'm working at the White House. Well, what, isn't that exactly what we hoped would happen? And we've had several thousand students involved. We're trying to expand into Washington, D.C. currently and into Los Angeles, where we have groups of supporters that are willing to raise the necessary money. Our budget is uh, over $2 billion now. Interestingly, one of our big problems was getting foundations involved. They, like the idea of getting students involved in civic activities, but politics? They ran from it like uh, poison. And it's taken quite a while to bring in some of the foundations to recognize that we aren't there to support President Obama or, or Mitt Romney or Mike Madigan or John Cullerton that, or Governor Rauner, that we are there to encourage people to get involved in the process so that the substantial portion of our budget now comes through foundations. But uh, I'm very optimistic, and mostly I'm optimistic that this generation that uh, uh, we wring our hands about and say how high the crime rate is and how 
uninvolved they are, that the ones who have talent, who have enthusiasm and have ability, somehow are rising to the top. And I'm very optimistic about where they're going. I think it's probably appropriate. I know there's at least one participant in the Lincoln or in the Lincolns in the Make the Challenge who is here. If I can have you identify yourself in the back there. So Judge, there's living proof. I'm delighted. <laughs> I, I wanted to dig way back into the 1950s and 60s when you were working in the Illinois State Legislature because as you know many of my interviews are with about Illinois politics more than the the federal level and maybe the first question isn't even about that it's about an event most of many of the people in the audience remember and the rest of them should have read about it in the in the history books and that's the 68 Democratic Convention and I wonder if you could maybe tell a tale on one of your fellow independent Democrats, a name that almost everybody will recognize. Now, which one are you? Well, Senator Don Clark Netsch. Oh, Don Clark Netsch. Wonderful lady. <coughs> the 68 convention was a searing uh, event in American political history. For those of you who are too young to remember, it was the height of the Vietnam War. Uh, President Johnson had announced he wasn't going to run again because he had, he realized that he had lost the support of much of his base, particularly young people. They were so outraged about the war. Um, they thought it was so, un, so wrong for us to be in Vietnam. And, and the uh, outrage was spilling over into violence. We had the weathermen. We had the Kent State... Uh, uh, incident where several uh, college students were killed by the the guard, the Illinois, the state guard, not Illinois. Um, one, during the convention, one of the favorite sayings of the group that were demonstrating in Grand Park was, "Hey, hey, LBJ, how many kids did you kill today?" And it's just a, a very bitter, bitter. <coughs> experience and, and it led to a riot uh, on the Thursday night when when uh, Daly, Mayor Daly was hoping that President Johnson would come in on a helicopter and save the convention what had already been a, a, a great distress. Uh, he pulled all the senior police out to the convention center leaving rookies at Grant Park and the, uh, the demonstrators were particularly unruly and there was a huge riot that extended all the way up to Lincoln Park and it was just the, the worst example of crowd control and riot control and these rookie policemen just didn't know how to handle it and they were unprepared they weren't trained for it and they were engaging in a lot of head beating and roughing up of these kids uh, they were fortunate there were no guns uh, actually there were machine guns mounted on the the overpasses at uh, Soldier Field and other places, but there weren't any guns used that night. But the violence and the bloodshed was pretty bad at the extent that Don Clark Netsch, this very distinguished state senator with this very um, eloquent voice that she had, a law professor of great distinction, was so infuriated she was standing on the corner at Lincoln Park yelling at the police, pigs, pigs, fascist pigs. And the idea of Don Clark Natch even knowing that uh, such a connotation for the Chicago police was just one example of how bad that, that whole period was. And, and uh, it was an experience that I, that was the last convention I went to until 1996. Uh, I just... Even though I was a delegate by way of my being in Congress, I could not stand the idea of going to another convention. Of course, the 96 convention, which was also held here in Chicago, was the model of what a large gathering ought to be. The policemen were so polite, and everyone who was, all the delegates from all over were commenting how beautiful the city was and how friendly everybody was. 
a far cry from 70, from uh, 68. Another question about the old days in Illinois politics, and in this respect, it was something that was pretty unique to Illinois, and that's the cumulative voting process that uh, we had until 1982. I know you have strong feelings about that, but for the handful of folks who might not understand that, you might want to start off with a quick explanation what that was. Well, it was very, very unique. Illinois was the only state in the country that had it, and it started as a result of, of Colonel Medill of uh, Chicago Tribune fame, who after the Civil War uh, proposed that Illinois elect three representatives for the House of Representatives from each district, uh, and that uh, they would be elected on a partisan basis, but they would be elected through cumulative voting, which meant that every voter would have three votes that they could cast all three for one candidate, which was called bulleting your vote for a candidate, or one and a half for each of two candidates, or one for each of three candidates. What that it ensured, and was true all the way to 1982 when we, we got rid of it, was that Minorities were elected, uh, minority party minorities were elected in each district. So that even in the suburbs, which were then rock solid Republican, every district had at least one Democrat. And so, for example, uh, uh, the North Shore, which was very, very Republican, had Harold Katz elected as a state representative. Uh, the South Suburbs, which were also very Republican at that time, had Tony Scariano as one representative. And one of the nice parts about that cumulative voting system is it applied to primaries as well as the general elections. And that's how Paul Simon and I both got elected to the legislature in the first place. I lived in a very heavily Democratic area in the uh, city of Chicago but it was very machine dominated and I had uh, already had my experiences with the machine that they didn't want nobody, nobody sent. But because of cumulative voting, I was able to run as a Democrat independent of the machine. If they wanted to elect two, as was a custom, each district would elect two of the majority and then the minority was allowed to elect one they had to split their vote between two candidates. So I ran as an independent Democrat and I won with some 40% of the vote because they had to split their, the machine had to split their voters among the two candidates that they were trying to elect. That's how I got nominated and of course thereafter uh, it was a Democratic district and I got reelected for five terms. It was a it was a very, very successful program. There were some problems with it. Many of the districts didn't have enough of the minority party to even elect one legitimately, and frequently, as has happened on the west side of Chicago, the majority party, the Democrats, would nominate a nominal Republican who was actually a Democrat, or who was somebody who was under Democratic control, and so, you ended up with some Republican members and some Democratic members that weren't really supportive of their party. And indeed, uh, the West Side Republicans were known as the West Side Bloc. And they were basically under the, the uh, they were available to the Democratic majority because all they had to do is distribute a few more patronage jobs and they got the, uh, they got votes out of them. And I remember uh, we had this kosher nostra that I described before. We were pretty independent of our party leadership on some issues. And on one occasion, the then speaker, Jack Toohey, came to us and he was looking for votes. And he said, you know, if you guys don't vote for this issue, I just have to give some more jobs to the West Side block. Uh, in, in order to get them to vote for it. Now, which would you rather have? Some patronage jobs going to them or voting for this because your party's asking you to? And sometimes the call was tough. But it was a very successful system. Pat Quinn, uh, 
uh, who I'm very fond of and who I supported enthusiastically except for this issue, decided on one of his early crusades in 1882 that he could uh, persuade the Illinois voters that this was wasting a lot of money because we had three representatives where one representative would do and would save something like $50 million, an important piece of the budget. And in addition, it would get rid of the West Side Block. Well, he persuaded the League of Women Voters and several of the newspapers to support him. And in a referendum, uh, we got rid of cumulative voting. And unfortunately, uh, we miss it. I, I suspect it may be a little easier for the leadership to control the, the House and the Senate. But uh, it certainly has uh, eliminated the, the uh, the origin of so many of the independent uh, Democrats and Republicans that had served in the state legislature in the 50s and 60s and 70s. The next question is another look into Illinois politics, perhaps, but how does a, a guy from the south side of Chicago who's been representing the south side in both the Illinois House and the U.S. Congress end up representing us from the city of Evanston? Not very easily. <laughs> Uh, in, in 19, I had been elected to the Congress. I had run first in 1966 against the incumbent and had lost. But in 1968, uh, then Mayor Richard J. Daley uh, declared neutrality in the primary, and I was able to beat the, the uh, incumbent, Barrett O'Hara, and I served two terms from the south side of Chicago, including Hyde Park, South Shore, and South Suburbs. And then in 72, there was a reapportionment. Now, there's a big disagreement about whether Daley had his, uh, the, it was his idea, or whether it was the Republicans' majority that uh, made the remap. But the event of it was that my district was carved into three pieces. One, the one I lived in was uh, included most of, of Ralph Metcalf's district, a very distinguished uh, African-American congressman. And there was no way I could run against him. And the other uh, piece of my district, South Shore, included Morgan Murphy, who was a very popular incumbent. And the suburban piece was represented by Ed Dewinsky. And Dewinsky, who was an old friend from the legislature, called me. He said, Ab, I would love to run for you to run against me. And I said, Ed, I can read the numbers as well as you can. <laughs> there was no way of running from that district. So I decided to move, and, and uh, they had created the, the 10th district was uh, at that time considered to be a very Republican district. Uh, and it had uh, all kinds of Republicans uh, uh, over the years, uh, most of them interestingly from Evanston. And uh, uh, Don Rumsfeld was a, a, a congressman from that district. Uh, Ralph Church was a was a uh, congressman from that district. His widow was a Republican from that district, and it was considered to be a safe Republican district when they when they apportioned it. But people frequently vote with their feet. And there had been a lot of Hyde Parkers and South Shore people who had been moving to Evanston, Skokie, and Wilmette, and Winnetka, and uh, so much so that Adlai Stevenson had carried the district in 1970. So in 72, when I had no place uh, to run from, I decided to move to Evanston and run from there. And I remember when I uh, talked to one of the committeemen up there, and the committeemen, unlike the city committeemen, were pretty independent of the organization, people like Lynn Williams and uh, uh, Aaron Jaffe. But I remember when I talked to Lynn Williams, and he was very dubious about my being able to win, and I said, well, you know, Adley Stevenson carried this district in 1970. He said, so you're going to run as Abner Mikva the third and try to get elected? <laughs> Uh, we were both right. The, the district had become more democratic, but I lost in 72, but was able to get the seat back in 74. And 
from there on in, I retained it, and through three general elections, uh, the 76th one was uh, my most barely election. I won by 201 votes out of almost 200,000 cast. Um, recently at, uh, uh, at the presidential medal ceremony, uh, Tom Brokaw was given the Medal of Freedom, and he was sitting behind me, and I turned to him, and you know, I hadn't seen him in 20 years, and I said, I don't know if you remember me or not, I'm Abner Mikva. He said, of course I remember you, you're Landslide Mikva. <laughs> 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 so that's how I carried the uh, district. Uh, I'm happy to say that uh, the district, from a partisan point of view, that the district has become very democratic now, and... Uh, Barack Obama carried uh, the district by 70% of the vote. Well, I don't want to discuss this, but I know one of your regrets having been out of the U.S. Congress for two years was it was during those two years that uh, Nixon impeachment was yes. going on. But my next question, I want to jump ahead about two decades or more. You had that time that, that you were a uh, U.S. Justice, very distinguished career. You and I didn't talk about it that much because you've had another extensive interview about that chapter of your life. But then you were called up by Bill Clinton to serve as his chief counsel. And I wonder if you could tell us about how you first met Bill Clinton. Well, I had met him formally in some uh, engagement where judges were present, but I really had not, outside of that one occasion, I had not had any dealings with him. I was um, chief judge of my circuit court, and I was 69 years old, and under our rules, you had to step down as chief judge when you were 70. So I had a, a little over a year to go before I would have to step down as chief judge. I could have stayed on the court, but I would no longer be chief judge. And I'd been on the court by, for 15 years by that time, and uh, the idea of being an ex-chief judge uh, didn't really appeal to me. I'd been involved in too many cases where ex-deans had stayed on the faculty and I saw the way they squirmed when the new dean did something they didn't like. And uh, I remember telling my predecessor, Pat Wall, a very wonderful lady who'd been chief judge before me, I said, you know, you must have the sorest tongue in Washington. She said, what does that mean? I said, well, I think of all the times you have to bite it when I did something that you didn't agree with, but you have to keep your mouth shut as an ex-chief judge. So um, I was thinking that I might want to do something else anyway. When I got a call from an old friend, Lloyd Cutler, who was then temporary White House counsel, uh, involved in a story that isn't too relevant, and he asked me, he said, uh, let's have lunch. And at lunch he said, how would you like to become White House counsel? Well, I'd never thought about it before, but the idea of being involved in the executive branch appealed to me mightily. I'd, the only involvement I'd had was as a second lieutenant in World War II, and that's hardly very much involved at all. And I said I would. And um, Leon Panetta was then the chief of staff, and I met with him, and he and I had served together in Congress, and we knew each other. And, and he said... Uh, We'd like you to take the job. We want you to meet the president. I remember going over on a Sunday night, uh, sitting in the uh, West Wing, and uh, the president came over in his golf clothes and uh, looking very relaxed. And uh, he said, Judge, which I, became my name from there on in. Every time he called me, it was Judge. <laughs> and he <laughs> said, uh, I'd like you to become my counsel. I promise I'll never lie to you. And, uh, in the, well, in the two years I was there, he never did lie to me. Now, you have to understand, I left two months before Monica Lewinsky was hired, <laughs> <laughs> which I thought was a great prescience on my mind to know that she was going to be hired and what she was going to do. Um, I had a very good experience there. He was, uh, he was a good boss. He would lose his temper every once in a while. Uh, in fact, uh, we had a, a code with my administrative assistant. If the president just wanted to chat, she'd let me know that the, the president would like to, you to come down and talk with him. 
But if he was mad about something, the message was, you're wanted in the Oval Office. And I knew <laughs> that, that was trouble. Um, but I enjoyed my two years there. I found him a delightful uh, boss. He was in, uh, he did a lot of great things that I approved of. He did some things, this is all before Lewinsky, that I didn't agree with, but uh, he always gave me a respectful hearing, even when we were in disagreement. And after I left, uh, I was one of those uh, a uh, few, well, I mean, I don't know how many there were, but I, when he first said that he did not have any s involvement with that woman, I believed him, not because I knew he was, uh, because I believed he was incapable of it, I knew his, his reputation with women was different, but I couldn't understand how anything could have happened given the geography of the Oval Office there. <laughs> I remembered the Oval Office and it had a people where his very pro proper Christian secretary would look in to make sure he was all right and the pre President Clinton would never have done anything to embarrass himself in front of her. And then he had his private office which also had a people for the Secret Service to look in to make sure that he was all right. And I couldn't believe he would do anything while uh, uh, possible to, that could possibly have surveillance by the Secret Service. I forgot about the pantry. <laughs> <laughs> and those of you who remember your Monica Lewinsky history well enough, remember that that's where all the action occurred. I had a great deal of trouble after uh, the impeachment, I decided that the best thing I could do for him was not to say anything, that I couldn't, he had enough advisors, and so I wouldn't take any speeches, and I wouldn't uh, give any interviews. And my daughter, who's a rabbi, called me, and one of her colleagues had um, just taken on a congregation in western Massachusetts, and he wanted to know would I please come and talk to them. And he understood when she told him that I wouldn't talk about Monica Lewinsky, I'd just talk about the separation of powers and so on. Well, I don't know how many of you have ever been to Western Massachusetts, but you can't get there from here, really. <laughs> uh, you have to fly into Albany, and then it's a four-hour drive, and I ended up coming in late and tired, and uh, it was a large crowd. and. Uh, the rabbi introduced me and I made my speech about the separation of powers and sat down. Well, of course, the first question out of the box was about Monica Lewinsky <laughs> and I bobbed and weaved for a while, but I was tired and, and provoked and finally then this gentleman got up in front and said, now judge, if you were his lawyer when this all came about, what would you have told the president? And by this time I, I said I was angry and I said, I'd have told him to mess, never mess around with a Jewish woman unless he was going to marry her. <laughs> <laughs> well, it brought down the house, and it also was the next day's Boston Globe. <laughs> <laughs> well, Judge, I'm going to steal somebody's thunder out there in the audience and ask you this question. You had a chance to see both Bill Clinton and, obviously, Hillary Clinton. You want to make any... Uh, reflections or comparisons between the two? Well, they're two completely different people. Um, he grew up a poor boy in Arkansas, uh, one of these, uh, yeah, the kind we used to describe as yellow dog Democrats. The one that would vote for a Democrat even was a yellow dog. She grew up in Park Ridge, Illinois. I don't know how much you know about Park Ridge, but it's very, very Republican. I used to represent it. She was a Goldwater girl in high school. Uh, it wasn't until she went to college that she became uh, impressed with, with uh, some of the liberal politics of our country and uh, wrote a paper on Solalinsky, who was one of the great organizers and, and uh, political figures in Illinois and Chicago. And um, when I knew them at the White House, they were still two very different people. His 
all of his liberalism and all of his political responses were visceral. I mean, he just, I mean, for instance, he, he, could, be, uh, he could be tempted by many, many things in addition to women, but uh, he would, you know, know how to cut a political corner. There were certain things that he was very, very uh, firm on. One of them was race, for example. I don't think you ever could have persuaded him to to uh, back off on some of the racial issues that confronted him. Uh, he was a little less firm about tobacco, and I, even though he had himself given up smoking, except an occasional cigar, he was very, very unhappy about the idea of the government taking a strong position against cigarettes because, as he pointed out correctly, it would be the, the very end of the Democratic Party in the South. Uh, the, the party was already reeling because of the race issue, but uh, coming out strong against tobacco and losing states like Kentucky and Tennessee and, and West Virginia, as far as he was concerned, that just didn't make any sense. And I remember um, one meeting at the White House, uh, one of those difficult meetings that happened at late at night, or seven, eight o'clock at night, and at that time, we had a Surgeon General whose name escapes me, but he was very uh, active in trying to get us involved in, in prohibiting uh, smoking and setting up various health measures to uh, uh, prevent smoking. And he was making, putting a lot of pressure publicly on, on the President and uh, this small meeting of uh, President senior staff, Leon Panetta, and I, and Harold Ickes, and uh, I remember the president at one point saying, I don't know why we just don't fire the goddamn guy. Why am I putting up with this? And, <laughs> and Mr. And Leon Panetta said, Mr. President, you can't fire him. And uh, he was not convinced, and he grumbled out. And the next morning, he announced he was siding with the attorney general. Now, there was only one voice between that meeting in his statement the next day, and that was Hillary's. Hillary had turned into this very pragmatic Democrat. I think that was the best way of describing her when I knew her then. She, uh, uh, on women's issues and on race issues, she was clearly all the way. But on other issues, she would approach the problem pragmatically. And for example, as far as she was concerned, the only health care program that made sense was universal health care, and that's what they came up with in their quiet little committee. She didn't really understand politics that well. She had never been involved in them much, except as First Lady of Arkansas. But that's not the Hillary Clinton that's now running for president, because from that time as First Lady of the United States to the time she was senator from New York, to the time she was Secretary of State, to the time she's now a candidate for president. She's become not only a, a good pragmatic politician that she was developing in the White House, but has become very, very committed to the ideas that uh, Bill held this early. And while she still doesn't have the same good old boy spark that he has in front of crowds, she doesn't stir him up the way he did, but uh, I think she's going to win. I think she's going to be a great president. One more question before the audience gets a chance to ask a few. You've served in all three branches of the federal government. Which one of those three do you think you have the strongest affinity for that your talents are better suited for? Well, present time excluded <laughs> the Congress of the United States. I wouldn't serve there now for all the tea in China. <laughs> but it was the best experience I ever had, except perhaps my experience in the legislature. I love the legislative process. I am fascinated by how well it works when it works. And it does work most of the time. It's hard to tell that now by what the Congress is doing, and indeed, it's hard to tell that by what's happening in Illinois, but when, when the legislative process is allowed to take its course, and you have these people from 
different parts of the state, different parts of the country, and different backgrounds, and different education, and different points of view, work together. It's incredible how much can get done and how fast things can get done. I was telling Eileen earlier that that I was proud to to hold the record with Tom Railsbeck, a Republican from downstate Illinois. Um, we were the floor managers for the 27th Amendment, which is the right to vote for 18-year-olds. It had passed originally as a statute, and the Supreme Court had struck it down as far as uh, state elections were concerned. It said that Congress didn't have the power to regulate the age for voting for state elections. Uh, the 27th Amendment allows anybody 18 and over to, to uh, vote in, in all elections. So uh, under Ted Kennedy's leadership in the Senate, uh, they put together a Senate amendment which was deliberated on and passed in the Senate by a two-thirds vote, deliberated on, and we passed it in the House by a two-thirds vote, and it was sent out to the states, and three-quarters of the states ratified the amendment all within a two-year span. And that's the way the legislative process is supposed to work. And the executive branch wasn't involved at all. One of the, uh, uh, I'm a nitpicker when it comes to historical political movies. And one of the great um, uh, flaws in Lincoln was this scene, I don't know, I trust most of you saw it, if not you should, was when he's standing up there and this has this been this debate about getting the 14th Amendment ratified, which takes a two-thirds vote in the House. The Senate had already ratified it. And he stands up there and looks at his main lobbyist and says, I want this amendment on my desk by Friday. Well, the flaw is that the executive branch doesn't have anything to do with constitutional <laughs> amendments. They go through the Congress by a two-thirds vote, and then it has to be ratified by three-quarters of the state. I still remember one of those flaws when I was in the legislature. Uh, Otto Kerner was not the greatest student of Illinois government, and uh, we were talking about a revenue article that the uh, Republicans were proposing as a constitutional amendment that uh, we Democrats were opposed to. And I remember he said, if it comes to my desk, I'll veto it. And someone had to point out to him that it would never come to his <laughs> desk. <laughs> okay, we've got a microphone on either side. Then we ask that if you have questions, please go there for two reasons. This is being filmed, but more importantly, so the rest of the audience can hear the question. And sir, over here, it looks like you get the first shot. Full disclosure, I was a student of uh, Professor Sam Gove at the University of Illinois and a product of the Legislative Staff Intern Program. And my recollection is, this is taking you back over 50 years, but that uh, Professor Gove always credited you and Senator Arrington, who was the leader I worked for, as being the driving forces behind the establishment of that program. And I wondered if you wouldn't just reflect on one, your ability to work as a liberal Democrat with a conservative Republican leader, but also uh, your inspiration for getting that program started and what it's led to. Well, the inspiration, first of all, it's one of my proudest accomplishments in the legislature. The inspiration was Sam Gove. Uh, he came to me with the idea, and he had um, already had the possibility of maybe the Ford Foundation helping to finance it if we could get it through. And um, uh, we talked and, and uh, I said, we, you know, I, I think maybe I can get it through the House, but we need a good Republican sponsor in the Senate. And he said, well, what about Russ Arrington? Well, Russ and I had gotten along. It was uh, in the days when Republicans and Democrats got along pretty well. And even though he was indeed a conservative Republican and was at that time majority leader in the Senate, he also was somebody who had visions of what the state could do and should do. 
And when Sam and I presented him with the idea, he was very enthusiastic and said he would be delighted to take it up. And I, I'm not sure about this, but I think it may have even passed the Senate first before I was able to pass it in the House. And I remember that the big argument against, well, the argue, all kinds of arguments against it, but the biggest argument that I remember in the House was uh, this one downstate Republican got up and said, you pass these bill and these fillers will come down here and they'll learn about the job and they'll run against you. <laughs> and nothing pleased me more than when Jim Edgar fulfilled that, re that uh, prediction and ran uh, for the legislature and was elected after having been a, uh, a, uh, a fellow and, of course, later went on to become governor. Our next question is right over here. Thank you. Thanks for welcome to Spring back to Springfield, Congressman. I'm one of your former constituents from the old 2nd Congressional District on the south side. You talked about the MICFA Challenge, a great program, and uh, possibly expanding it, or maybe you have expanded it to Los Angeles and Washington, D.C. What about, why not expand it to the state capitol right here in Springfield? I'd love it. It needs, I kept hoping, I, I, I'm certainly not uh, a modest person, but uh, I certainly don't, don't have any uh, copyright on the idea of it being sponsored by some other <coughs> politician in some other place. But what would it really would be great if there was somebody who had some name recognition and some support to sponsor it in a, another local place. We found out we couldn't do that, even though we tried in Los Angeles and in San Francisco, we couldn't find anybody that would be willing to take it on. But then what we need as, as a second alternative, at least, is some base of financial support uh, to get it started. And we were able to get that uh, base in, in Los Angeles and in Washington. I'm not sure that exists in Springfield. And in, we do have a governor right now who's pretty wealthy. Uh, I'm not sure his ideas about government and mine agree. <laughs> As I said, my, I always take out of the Gettysburg Address the fact that Lincoln was talking about government. And the whole premise of the Mikvah Challenge, we are bipartisan and we are nonpartisan, but we do believe in government. And so I think that the sponsorship has to be some, a sponsorship that believes in government. I'd love it if it could happen in Springfield. We have a young man who has the next question for you, Judge. Hi. Um, my question is about what you said about the current Congress. I can't Can hear you. Can you speak up it a little, please? about the current Congress that you talked about, how you wouldn't want to serve there. I still can't hear you. Oh, <laughs> sorry. It was about the, uh, the current Congress, how you were talking about that earlier. Uh, and you're saying how you didn't want to serve there. Uh, but I don't think I don't think we're as divided as we were. We're not as polarized as we were in the Civil War. But I think right now we're kind of paralyzed and we're not really able to do anything. Uh, and I know that when you served in Congress, despite the fact that people may have had differences, but they were still able to come together and compromise. So my question was, what do you think is missing from the current political climate that? Uh, makes people look at compromise, it's a dirty word, and prevents people from compromising. Well, I think the biggest difference is that we have had this long history of people running against government and getting elected by being against government. And I hate to admit it started with, not started, but it took a great deal of, of uh, strength through the election of Jimmy Carter, one of my heroes, but he ran against Washington. He was, you know, uh, he was uh, uh, get rid of uh, these excesses of government. And Bill Clinton talked about the era of big government is over. And of course, Ronald Reagan uh, uh, got elected on get the government off our backs. And uh, Governor Rauner uh, got elected on, you know, that we needed less government in Illinois. The problem is, if you don't believe in government, how can you cooperate and compromise with people uh, when the whole idea is to stop government? Uh, you may recall the shutdown in Washington 
uh, I wasn't there, fortunately, but when government shut down there a few years ago, uh, it was the intention of many of the members of Congress to shut it down. Newt Gingrich, well, this I happened, I was already left the White House, but Newt Gingrich thought it would be a good idea to shut down the government for a while and teach the president a lesson. You, you can't talk about compromise and getting together when somebody is saying, if you don't agree with me, I'm going to blow my brains out, which is basically what shutting down government and getting rid of government is about. If you don't bargain about the differences and find out where there can be common cause, obviously there's no way to govern. And the next question. Yes, sir. Well, first of all, could that have been C. Everett Cooper, the one that was uh, Surgeon General? Cooper. No, no, it was after Cooper. It was, um, he's... Okay. He was at, he went to Harvard or Yale after that on the medical faculty. Yeah. Any, anyway, my question is, was um, when Hillary Clinton and Obama were against each other in the primary, uh, I was in France and a Frenchman who read up on both of their voting records, which I found amazing because Americans don't even do that. He, he asked me the question, he says, why did Obama vote present so much in the Illinois, when he was in the Illinois legislature? And I didn't have, a pre I didn't have an answer, so I wondered if you did. I don't really, except that um, voting present in the legislature, well, there are two, two ways of, uh, it was the custom when I was in the legislature, and I'm not sure whether it has changed since, that if you were absent on a vote, one of your colleagues would vote you present just for the record. It didn't mean anything. It meant you weren't there, but uh, you voted present. Indeed, during my uh, time in the legislature, we had a couple of scandals where members were voting their seatmates who weren't there and voting them I or nay on an issue when they weren't there. And, the, the body decided that was not a good idea. But it was sort of an accepted custom that if you weren't there and you didn't want your absences from the legislature to be used against you in the next election, a uh, good colleague would mark you or indicate you were present. Um, I don't know if that still existed or not. There were a lot of times that I voted present on issues simply because I didn't understand them. Um, you know, the legislative process in Springfield, we take up an awful lot of bills, a lot more than they do in Congress. We don't have the uh, full committee hearings that sometimes go on in Congress for months and months and months. And sometimes a bill would come to the floor that I simply didn't know enough about to vote either way, and I would vote present. Those are the only explanations I can gather. I, don't, I think there was only one gut issue that he voted present on. I don't remember whether that was, I don't think it was capital punishment. It was our gun issue, but it was some hot button issue. And my guess is that he just wasn't there. Thank you. I'm going to take an opportunity to, to jump in with another question myself here, Judge, um, and preface it by this. I think there is at least one difference between uh, Abraham Lincoln and Barack Obama, and I understand you were an important mentor to Barack Obama. I don't think you played that role for, for Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> I just missed it. <laughs> Tell me about the, that relationship, how you got to know uh, Barack Obama. Well, it started, I was a uh, judge at the time on the Court of Appeals, and uh, I was always looking to, to uh, get more diversity among my clerks. I, I, each judge had, was allowed to have four law clerks, and uh, I would try to get some diversity, both uh, geographical, uh, so that they didn't all come from the Ivy League, and racial and uh, ethnic. Um, and so my, one of my then present clerks had graduated from Harvard, and uh, she said that this fellow who had been elected president of the Harvard Law Review was African-American. He was 
from Chicago, and uh, I should uh, look at him. So I said, tell him, she was going up to Cambridge the following week, and I said, well, tell him I'd like to interview him, because he sounded like somebody I really wanted to, to, uh, to hire. Uh, she came back and said, no, he doesn't want a clerk. He's going back to Chicago and run for public office. Well, I thought that was a little bit, uh, I, when I met him later on, I teased him about it, being an uppity black who only wanted a clerk for a black, <laughs> a black judge. And he said, no, no, no. He said, I, I just wanted to get in politics. So at the time, I thought, well, you, know, you just don't come to Illinois and plant your flag and saying, okay, elect me. But uh, by the time I came back to Chicago some years later, six or eight years later, he was already a member of the state senate and uh, going great guns. He was also teaching part-time at the University of Chicago where I was teaching. And so we started to have breakfast together and I became fascinated. And of course, he was happy to hear about my, my experiences in Congress. Um, <coughs> one of our pastimes, I don't know whether he still does this or not, but he used to play a lot of poker in, in Springfield, and so did I when I was there, and we used to compare notes about the other players and whether they could <laughs> bluff or not. Um, and we became good friends. And then I just, I should also say that he was an incredible professor. Uh, the students at the University of Chicago grade their professors at the end of the year on a scale of one to 10. And Barack Obama's grades were traditionally, I mean, his, always nines and tens. It was the envy of all of his colleagues that the students loved him so well. And most of them had no idea that he was a Democrat or what his, his views were. He was so good at teaching, uh, you know, provoking the students without rec letting them know what his own views were. So we started having breakfast together and I became more and more impressed with him. And, when he announced he was going to run against Bobby Rush for Congress, I, I, I was very, I supported him. I'm not sure how supportive I was in terms of thinking he could win, because I know how hard it is to beat a, an incumbent congressman. And particularly, I was a little bit nervous when I first heard him in a black church. I went to a black church with him one Sunday, and he was Professor Obama. It was, well, um, mm -hmm, uh, and that's not what people go to church, or at least not the black churches, to hear. And uh, he lost that election, as you know, very badly. And he was, uh, for a while, thinking of leaving politics. He was considering taking a job with a not-for-profit uh, foundation in Chicago. And then the... Uh, open seat of a, uh, for the Senate opened up in uh, 04, and he jumped in. And the first time I heard him after that, I realized that in those four years or two years, whatever it was, he had uh, brushed up on his uh, Martin Luther King. He could have taught Dr. King a lesson about <laughs> speaking in a black church. And if you don't believe me, just go back and listen to that eulogy that he performed in Charleston. I mean, it was, it will go down as one of the historical speeches of this president because it was so moving and he so had the audience. Anyway, uh, I was very much involved in that Senate campaign. That's when we thought he was probably the luckiest politician that ever lived. He was running third in the primary for the Senate, and then the first, uh, the front runner uh, by the name of Hull exploded in a sex scandal. But even then, uh, we thought, this was two weeks before the election, we thought that the votes would go to, to uh, Hines, who was running second. And miraculously, they jumped over Hines and went to Obama, and in those last two weeks, he went from third to first, and then the, the Republicans had nominated what appeared to be a very strong candidate for the Senate by the name of Ryan, no relation to the governor. Jack Ryan. Jack Ryan. 
who had a great reputation. First of all, he made a lot of money that he was able to spend. He'd been teaching in a parochial school and had a great uh, 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 capacity to speak to crowds. And then he got caught up in a sex scandal, and he had to drop out, and the Republicans ended up with Alan Keyes. And uh, as a yellow dog Democrat, I want Alan Keyes as my opponent all the time. <laughs> Well, Judge, I see we've got Eileen here who's coming up. Looks like we need to hand it over to her. Well, I want to thank Judge Mikva for an extraordinary evening and, of course, Mark Depew, our oral historian. One quick comment, if I may. You hear a lot of things about Barack Obama's golf game. You hear a lot about the paddle ball that was played in a variety of instances in the H.W. Uh, Bush presidency. I learned something from reading the various interviews of Judge Mikva, and that was it's good to go to receptions. It's good to play paddle ball with the opponent. It's good to play golf with people on all sides of the aisle because that is the way you develop a sense of conviviality, a sense of understanding of who you are and what you are. So that, to me, um, I think that the more people play, the more people involved in sports, the more people learn to speak to each other at a reception, uh, how great it is. And of course, I want to thank especially uh, the members of the General Assembly who came here this evening um, to, to hear and to learn from, from their mentor, uh, Judge Mikva. And we hope to see you here very frequently in the future. So I think I see, I see Senator Biss, I see, I see President Cullerton, I see Senator McGuire, Yes, Senator Collins. Yes, Don Harmon. So I want to thank you all for coming this evening and thank this audience for its very great political understanding. And another round of applause for Judge Mikva. Thank you. Wonderful job. Let's get you off the podium here before okay. people start coming up and talking right. to you. So.